Welcome to this Good Fellow Unit webinar on antibiotic use tonight and our responsibility to prescribe these only when it's for the right reasons and for the right times. This webinar is kindly supported by Pharmac tonight. My name is Dr Helen Filcher, I'm a GP and I work for the Good Fellow Unit. And our expert speaker for tonight is Dr Mark Thomas, an infectious disease physician at Auckland City Hospital and an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine and, and Health Sciences in the University of Auckland. And Dr Thomas is going to challenge us tonight about why we are prescribing antibiotics for placebo and don't we care about the efficacy, the long-term efficacy of these important medicines. So I'd like to hand over to you, Dr Thomas, to start your presentation for the evening. Thank you very much, Helen. It's a, um, it's a great pleasure um, to be here and I'm honoured by the number of people who I can see on the screen in front of me uh, um, listening um, tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time to um, listen to what I'm going to say and I hope you find it interesting and um, helpful in your practice ahead. Uh, so my topic is why are we using antibiotics as placebos and don't we care about um, saving the efficacy of these valuable medicines for future generations. And I'd like to begin by um, providing an analogy between antibiotic resistance and antibiotic overuse that drives antibiotic resistance with other environmental catastrophes that are gradually occurring around the planet in various different parts of the environment. Antibiotic resistance is an environmental issue in the same way. And we are, with antibiotic treatment, selecting progressively more and more antibiotic resistant bacteria and fungi to live on us and in us and we're ensuring that gradually the germs that live on people and in people are more and more resistant to the antibiotics that we can use to treat infections. And so the gradual, slow change that each of us thinks is not contributed to by anything we do is analogous to the gradual slow change in the rivers and lakes in our countries and the loss of biodiversity in the oceans around us and in the land around us as a result of small things that we do or that farmers do or fisher people do or others do to degrade the environment of this planet and the degrading that occurs as a result of antibiotic treatment excessive antibiotic treatment is the degrading of the quality of the germs that live on us and in us in summary i'm going to show that try to show that antimicrobial resistance emerges generally elsewhere in the world and then spreads in countries around the world. And I'm going to focus on New Zealand because that's what's important for most of us. I'm going to show that 95% of antibiotic use in New Zealand is in the community and only 5% in hospitals. So that if we're going to make a major difference to antibiotic use in New Zealand to try and slow the development of antibiotic resistance in New Zealand, we're going to have to focus on community use in New Zealand. We'll have to make changes in hospitals as well but the big change needs to be in community use. I will show you that antibiotic use in New Zealand is high in the community, but is not, in comparison with other countries, as high in hospitals in New Zealand, nor is antibiotic use high in farming in New Zealand. And I'll show you information that I think will hopefully convince you that there is a very large amount of unwise antibiotic use in the community in New Zealand. Antibiotic resistance is getting worse, as a result of all antibiotic use, but particularly wastefully as a result of unnecessary antibiotic use. And it is possible to change the prescribing practice of doctors in New Zealand as it is elsewhere. It's not easy, but it can be done. And I'll show you at the end that it's possible to make significant changes over time to antibiotic prescribing of general practitioners. So, we all know about excessive, unwise use of antibiotics and ex environmental exposure to antibiotics in other countries in the world. And here's a photograph from National Geographic last year of a street vendor in Haiti with all sorts of pills arranged by color um, that he might cut off with his pair of scissors that you can see at the top of his container and sell to someone who comes up to him in the street. I think probably the skill of his prescribing is um, much less than we would hope for. And antibiotics come leaking out of factories in India and other places around the world can contaminate the environment and lead to the development of antibiotic resistance in organisms living in wastewater and in the environment. And high use of antibiotics 
Um, for instance, this last line antibiotic, colistin, one of the last antibiotics we can use for the very resistant organisms that turn up in hospitals in New Zealand and elsewhere, um, you can see that it's been sufficiently widely used in China that E. coli, isolated from farmed pigs in China, a quarter of them are resistant to this last line antibiotic. So you can imagine that the problems will arise elsewhere around the world and that transported in the gut, on the skin of people coming from these other countries to New Zealand, these germs will arrive and do arrive in New Zealand inevitably, quite quickly after they emerge elsewhere. And then how fast they spread in New Zealand depends on how much antibiotic we use in New Zealand. And this figure illustrates the relationship between the amount of antibiotic use per head of population in a country and the proportion of strains of a bacterium that would be resistant to the antibiotic that's been used. So across the horizontal axis, you can see the amount of fluoroquinolone like ciprofloxacin or norfloxacin that's used per thousand population per day in a range of countries. And you can see that Italy and Portugal and Greece and Belgium of these European countries are the ones that use the most fluoroquinolone antibiotics like ciprofloxacin. And you can see that those countries and a few others, Spain and Hungary, that use large amounts of, of these antibiotics are the countries where the proportion of E. coli that are resistant to ciprofloxacin is highest. And you can see that in countries like the Scandinavian countries in the bottom left hand corner of the graph that use relatively small amounts of antibiotics are the ones where the rate of resistance to these antibiotics is lowest in E. coli. And the same sort of graph can be produced for a range of different bacteria and a range of different antibiotics. Use a lot of antibiotics, end up with a lot of antibiotic resistance. We use too much antibiotics in the community in New Zealand. Community consumption is high in comparison with other countries that have data and hospital consumption is relatively low in comparison with other countries that have data. So here are a range of somewhere about 25 different countries around the world where there's um, accurate data on the level per thousand population per day of community consumption and of hospital consumption. And you can see that New Zealand ranks relatively highly for community consumption, not as high as Greece or France or Belgium or Italy, but high in comparison, for instance, with the Netherlands or Sweden or Estonia down the bottom of the graph. And you can see that for hospital consumption, New Zealand is relatively low. And so when you put those two figures together, New Zealand actually is the country with the highest proportion of antibiotic consumption out of all these that are shown here that is in the community. 95% of antibiotic consumption, as I said before, in New Zealand is community consumption and only 5% hospital. I often get told, look, the problem is the jolly farmers. They are using too much antibiotics. That's the problem. Eric Hillerton and other vets um, in New Zealand measured the amount of antibiotic consumption in farmed and pet animals in New Zealand. They measure it as tons of antimicrobials per ton of animal in New Zealand, and they gathered the same data for a range of other countries. And you can see that the vertical axis represents the amount of antibiotic use per tons of animals in various countries around the world. And you can see that Cyprus is a country that uses an awful lot of um, antibiotics in animals. And you can see that New Zealand, Iceland, Sweden, Finland, Norway are countries that use relatively little antibiotics in farming and um, pet animals. Uh, we are not a country compared with others that uses a lot of antibiotics in farming. That's not to say that farmers couldn't use less antibiotics in the future, but that's not the major problem in New Zealand. We are a country that uses a lot of antibiotics in the community. This is community dispensed antibiotics. And you can see at the right end, end of the um, bar chart, New Zealand and um, we are, as I've shown with previous figures, higher than the Netherlands or other Scandinavian countries and a bit below Greece, Belgium, France, Italy. We are higher than Spain. 
we use a lot of antibiotics. This is data from 2010. And here's data from 2015. This now is number of antibiotic prescriptions per thousand population per day. And you can see that Australia dispenses more antibiotic prescriptions per thousand population per day than New Zealand does. There are only two other countries for which I'm pos it's possible to get data on an age-based basis, as I've got here in this graph. And you can see that the United States and Sweden are way below us in terms of the number of antibiotic prescriptions per thousand population per day. So there's a high rate of antibiotic prescribing in New Zealand compared with other countries around the world. Australia is a bit higher than us. At the bottom, I've put from this study, so this was a study looking at um, approximately uh, 4,000 registered general practice patients across the country during 2000, the whole of 2015, and 44% of all patients registered with the GP were dispensed at least one antibiotic course during this year. I think most people would think that's probably excessive. Most antibiotic consumption in New Zealand is of penicillins. You can see that the other classes uh, cephalosporins in green, tetracyclines in purple, erythromycin, roxithromycin, and other macrolides in yellow, and the other drug classes make up much, much smaller proportions than penicillins. Here's information from the growing up in New Zealand cohort, which followed approximately four or 5,000 children from birth, um, and the data here is up to the age of five years, so 60 months. And you can see um, in the percentages that I've um, uh, got below the graph that 62% of children in their first year of life were dispensed an antibiotic, 77% in their second year of life, 73% in their third year of life. By the time they reached five years of age, there was only 3% of New Zealand children who hadn't received an antibiotic prescription. And you can see that in any year, it was 60% or higher. In contrast, in Sweden, 21% of children aged 0 to 6 years received an antibiotic each year. I think this suggests a very high rate of prescribing to children in New Zealand. And here's the number of antibiotic prescriptions dispensed to each of those children in the growing up in New Zealand cohort. And you can see that the average number of antibiotic prescriptions for new children in the new, growing up in New Zealand cohort in their first five years of life was almost two antibiotic courses on average per year. 9.5 antibiotic courses over a five-year period. Many people then say, well, we are not Sweden and we have a population that differs from Sweden. And I would agree with that. We have a population that is, in general, not as wealthy as people in Sweden are, we have a population in New Zealand that's, in general, younger than the population in Sweden. And we have particular ethnic communities with high rates of socioeconomic deprivation. We looked in particular at that in the data that I'm showing you here now. And it shows you that the level of dispensing per thousand population per day in New Zealand for people of different age groups is, in general, higher in Maori and Pacific Pacific shown in the blue line, Maori shown in the yellow line, than it is in people of European ethnicity shown in the crimson line, or in people of Middle Eastern, Latin American, or African ethnicity shown in the dark blue line, or in people of Asian ethnicity shown in the green line. So yes, we do dispense more antibiotics to Pacific and Maori people than we do to people of other ethnicities, but the difference is not very great. And that, to me, suggests that while the rate of infectious diseases in Maori and Pacific people is higher, they're not being given antibiotic um, prescriptions that are disproportionately greater than those given to other ethnic groups. And it makes me believe that we are over-prescribing to all ethnic groups in New Zealand. And the graph below, which shows the rate of prescribing by ethnicity, again, Pacific in blue, Maori in yellow, close to it, European in a ready orange color, 
African, Middle Eastern, Latin American in the purple color and Asian in the green. And it shows it by deprivation quintile. So those points above the number five to the far right side of the graph are people in the worst socioeconomic deprivation. And those people to the left in the deprivation quintile one are at the least. And you can see that there is relatively little difference between levels of prescribing by de degree of socioeconomic deprivation and much greater by ethnicity. Uh, thank you. A lot of the prescribing in New Zealand, as for other countries, is for coughs and colds, viral respiratory tract infections. Here's the different ethnicities in New Zealand during 2015 by month of the year. And you can see that for every ethnicity, there's a peak in the July, August, September months during the winter when people are more likely to have coughs and colds. You can see um, that at the top, I've indicated that the increase in the winter months compared with the summer months is about 26% higher. And that in other countries, Denmark and the United States, is that the United States? Oh can't see the, what comes after the U there, um, but I think it is. Um, the uh, proportion rise in the winter months is much less. These people also have coughs and colds, but their doctors prescribe less frequently for coughs and colds than we do. And here is the growing up in New Zealand data where you can see the seasonal variation is very great. And here is um, a graph from uh, Murray Tilliard at the... Uh, BPAC Centre in Southland. This is data from a very large number of general practices across the country. Each bar represents a general practice and the number below it, and you may not be able to read the numbers easily, the number below it represents the number of consultations for respiratory tract infections upper respiratory tract infections that were seen at that general practice. For instance, at this far left-hand bar, 164 consultations for upper respiratory tract infections. Some of them here, this one here, this bar, uh, 1,646 upper respiratory tract consultations. Over here, um, far right of the graph, only 85 respiratory tract consultations. And the height of the bar represents the proportion of those consultations for an upper respiratory tract infection that led in the next few days to dispensing of an antibiotic. You can see that across at the left end end of the um, graph of the 164 consultations at the far left hand um, general practice, uh, over 90% of consultations for an upper respiratory tract infection led to dispensing of an antibiotic. And I've put in orange dashed line, a fifth, the 50% line, and you need to come across an awfully long way, almost three quarters of general practices in New Zealand in 2014 dispensed an antibiotic, had to, gave a prescription for an antibiotic that was dispensed for patients with upper respiratory tract infections. Now we all know that most of those prescriptions are completely unnecessary and we all suspect that the patients cared for by the practices that are very uncommonly prescribing antibiotics won't be ending up in hospital as a result of antibiotic prescribing deficiency. Let me briefly, since I've dealt with numbers, now also talk about antibiotic prescribing practice in terms of the antibiotic that is selected and just show you this graph for regions of Sweden and the uh, degree to which general practitioners in various regions in Sweden come close to achieving the Swedish target that at least 80% of antibiotic prescriptions for children with respiratory tract infections, children aged 0 to 6 years, for the proportion to be 80% of penicillin V. Now, I can't hear you, but I can imagine um, many throwing up their hands in horror and um, saying, really, penicillin V, we don't prescribe that for anyone. You can't give it to people. They won't take it. It's got to be taken on an empty stomach. 
This is Sweden. This is the most recent guidelines from them in the last year or so saying we would like you to do better general practitioners in Sweden and achieve a 80% target for any antibiotics that you are prescribing for children aged 0 to 6 with respiratory tract infections. I'm not going to do the same thing for flucloxacillin, let alone for cephalexin or some other antibiotics. It is possible to care for a community well using narrow spectrum antibiotics that I will agree are slightly more tricky to take. They're not once a day prescriptions. They don't necessarily have the best taste in the world, but the countries that really care about this issue do it differently from us. That's enough from me about antibiotic prescribing and consumption in New Zealand. This is me just pointing out that the antibiotic prescribing that we do and the consumption that is done by our community does make a difference. So I've picked three common bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli. I've put some commonly used antibiotics up there and I've compared the proportion of those different organisms that are resistant to those antibiotics on the table that are resistant in Norway, New Zealand or Cyprus. So if we look at the first line for Streptococcus pneumoniae isolated in New Zealand, what proportion of them have a relatively reduced susceptibility to penicillin? Well, approximately one in five. What's the proportion in Norway? Well, much, much less. What's the proportion in Cyprus? Double. And if you look down that graph, you will see that for each of the organisms and antibiotics, that we're somewhere in the middle, that we use a lot of antibiotics and we've got moderately high levels of antibiotic resistance, not as low as they do in Norway, but not as high as they do in Cyprus. On the other hand, continuing the way we're going, we will catch up, not in terms of antibiotic use with Cyprus, but while they've got to high levels of antibiotic use already, of antibiotic resistance already, and probably will get even higher in the years ahead, over the next five or 10 years, we will head towards those levels that are present in Cyprus. And the problems that they are having with treating infections will become the problems that we will have then. And those were common organisms and common antibiotics and relatively worrying levels of antibiotic resistance that we've learned to live with. Coming along are problems that are very hard to live with. So some of you will have cared for patients with usually urinary tract infections caused by extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli or sometimes Klebsiella pneumoniae mostly E. coli, and will have found that it's very difficult to find an antibiotic that works against these E. coli, and occasionally that patients have to go into hospital to be treated for the whole course of their antibiotics with an intravenous antibiotic. And following along the line, of, along the path of antibiotic resistance from those E. coli, we've got now E. coli that are resistant to the antibiotics that we use in hospital, meropenem or ertapenem, carbapenem antibiotics that are increasingly resistant as well. So that we've got um, uh, antibiotic time bombs just starting to go off all over New Zealand that will get worse unless we do something about reducing our use. It's not easy, but it can be done. The patients um, are concerned about antibiotic um, they're aware about the problem of antibiotic resistance. Uh, if you look at uh, the bottom left, uh, sorry, let me express it another way, that um, doctors around New Zealand, this is a general practice survey of doctors, are you aware of problems with antibiotic prescri over prescribing? Um, Everybody is, except for um, one person who maybe hit the wrong button when answering the survey. How often do you prescribe antibiotics? Every day for two thirds of doctors. Do patients request antibiotics for m relatively minor infections, presumably ones that you think they don't need an antibiotic for? Yes, very commonly. Do you try and dissuade patients from taking antibiotics? Yes, very commonly. 
Have you noticed that antibiotics are becoming less effective? Well, half say yes, half say no. If we went back a couple of slides, let me remind you about um, where things are going. Antibiotics are becoming less effective. And the same problems as we're facing are faced by countries around the world and various other countries, France, Sweden, the UK, the US, have had programs that have tried to target antibiotic use and have reduced antibiotic use dramatically in each of those countries. The one I want to focus on is the UK. The NHS um, in 2013-2014 set a target for reducing antibiotic prescription in primary care by 1%. 1% reduction for each general practice across the country and um, provided a small financial incentive to general practitioners who achieved that target. The overall reduction amongst antibiotic amongst general practitioners in England at the end of the year was not a 1% reduction, but a 7% overall reduction. The target also was a 10% reduction in broad spectrum antibiotic use, antibiotics like Augmentin, Ciprofloxacin, and there was a 16% reduction. No education particularly, no other changes. This is the target we would like you to hit. A little bit of a financial incentive to hit the target and the general practitioners in England overachieved. I believe we could do the same here without um, any difficulty. And I think you could do it um, based on what you know already without any further education. I think we have excellent um, resources for changing antibiotic use. The BPAC guide is excellent and has recently been updated. Um, there's a, a nice guideline that's been developed by BPAC for New Zealand that talks about reducing antibiotic prescribing for patients with uh, respiratory tract infections. And um, with a local uh, PHO in Auckland, the East Health Trust, uh, we provided general practitioners in that PHO with a poster with not my photograph on it, but their own photograph of each GP signed by them to put up in the waiting room or to put up in their consulting room to provide them with a resource that could help them educate their patients and to help them reinforce their message to their patients. So for the patient in the waiting room could see this before coming in to um, talk with the doctor about antibiotics. And if it was in the consultation room, then the doctor who was having difficulty persuading the patient that antibiotics weren't needed could say, look, it's not just you, mate, or it's not just you, Mrs. Wilson. Um, I'm trying to get this message across to all my patients because it's an important issue that I believe strongly in. Thank That's you. enough from me. <laughs> well, actually, we've got quite a few questions coming through, um, which I didn't want to interrupt you, but relate to some of the, the information you've given us along the way, Mark. Um, a lot of it's been around our deprivation. Um, and one of them, one of the questions that has come through in, in, in a number of different ways is, does the high amount of community antibiotic prescription actually equate to inappropriate use in New Zealand? We have higher use in Sweden and the Netherlands, but we also have higher burden of certain communicable de diseases like rheumatic fever and strep throat. And that's been a common thing that's come through the questions is concern about strep throat. Um, and is our, yes, is our prescribing actually inappropriate given the differing burden that we have um, in New Zealand versus the Scandinavian countries? Thank you for asking that question, because yes, it is a, it's a major issue and um, we need to address it. So that uh, with uh, Murray Tilliard and Andy Tomlin in BPAC in Dunedin, we looked at antibiotic prescribing, and I've shown you some of the data already, um, by um, GPs for patients registered with GPs in New Zealand, and we looked at them, and I've given you the data by total antibiotic prescribing, and we looked at antibiotic class as well. And um, this, I'll show you this figure in more detail in just a minute. This is for penicillins. As I've said already, the bulk of antibiotic prescribing in New Zealand. Across here is the age of the patients who had a penicillin prescription dispensed, and the um, coloured lines represent different, different ethnic groups. And this is for tetracyclines. I just point this one out. Um, the highest rate of prescribing of tetracyclines in New Zealand was in um, European, the red line, uh, children aged 15 to 19. So this is being prescribed for acne um, to European, African, Middle Eastern and Asian people, and not so much to Pacific Island or Maori people, despite them having quite a lot of troublesome acne. 
I'll go on to the next slide, which shows, and I apologize for the fact that it's a little bit blurred, but hopefully you can see it well enough to get the message. So across here is age of the patient for whom a penicillin was dispensed. This is the graph for penicillins in New Zealand, prescriptions dispensed in general practice during 2015. The top line is Pacific people. So this is Pacific children aged 0 to 4, Pacific children aged 5 to 9, 10 to 16, sorry, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, etc. Blue, Pacific, yellow, Maori, red, European, purple, Middle Eastern, Latin and American and African, small numbers relatively, and green, Asian. And I want you to look particularly at the age group for whom treatment of sore throat and prevention of rheumatic fever is important. The people aged five to 20. And I'd like you to look and see what is the relationship between the amount of penicillin prescribed for, for instance, European people, the red line, aged 15 to 19, Maori people aged 15 to 19, and Pacific people aged 15 to 19. Basically the same. Despite the fact that European people do not get, essentially, rheumatic fever, they have sore throats, but they don't get um, rheumatic fever, certainly not to the rate that either Maori or Pacific people do. So yes, I would agree that there needs to be a discrepancy between the level of antibiotic prescribing for people of different ethnicities in New Zealand, in particular in relation to treatment of sore throats to prevent rheumatic fever. But I would point out that the discrepancy between the levels of prescribing in New Zealand of penicillins, which are the agents used to treat sore throats to prevent rheumatic fever, are not comparable with the differences in the rates of rheumatic fever between those ethnic groups in New Zealand. And I do not know whether all of that Maori and Pacific prescribing is appropriate. I have a lot of anecdotal information that tells me it's not, but I would certainly say that there's a huge amount of unnecessary prescribing of penicillins for European people, or else there's an awful deficit of prescribing for Maori and Pacific people. And I don't think there's actually a great deficit for Maori and Pacific people myself. And certainly I th there's a bit more discussion on here about our, our patients being increasingly fragile and poor and sicker, um, that we have steroids, immunosuppression, diabetes and smoking and the fallibility of coming back to a general practitioner when they, things are getting worse or when um, sands change. I think someone has put in here crowded circumstances, whole families presenting with strep and impetigo. Um, and the ability of giving back pocket scripts, not for taking, but possibly taking away in case things do change when they can't afford to come back. And I guess the back pocket scripts have come up quite a few times in our questions this evening. And do, as the evidence you mentioned in one of the graphs that the evidence was showing, your uh, scripts that were actually accessed, they weren't just back pocket scripts, they were given and they were accessed by the pharmacist or by the patients to the pharmacist. Is there a lot of evidence that includes just back pocket scripts and to see which ones are, are actually given out or not? All the information that I've presented on antibiotic consumption in New Zealand is on dispensing data. Yeah. There's excellent dispensing data in New Zealand, really, really detailed, excellent dispensing data that we can use, that, that can be used to inform each general practitioner of their mm. prescribing mm. and to get the sort of data that I showed about prescribing for upper respiratory tract infections. Mm. I guess I'm a little disappointed to have the responses coming back that you're telling me about when I've shown that graph that showed that there were an awful lot, an awful lot of general practices in New Zealand that more than three quarters were prescribing an antibiotic for a patient with an upper respiratory tract infection. Yes, um, let's go it back really to is a very depressing slide to me. And um, I, I do find it um, rather distressing that uh, that people say, well, no, we do need to do it. It's sort of like dairy farmers saying, no, we need more cows on the land. 
I think um, I will be inflammatory. <laughs> no, well, this, this that's is my we're, job. We're here to I want change. Ask the I questions. want change. <laughs> and and let me just say that um, the high level of antibiotic prescribing, slightly higher to Maori and Pacific people than to Europeans, looks as though it may be driving more antibiotic resistance in Maori and Pacific people than in European people or Asian people in New Zealand. So we should not think that um, there's a free lunch for people who are in the situation of deprivation, that we should be washing them in antibiotics mm -hmm. all the time. They will pay the cost of that excessive prescribing with more antibiotic resistance in their population. Mm -hmm. We will be possibly believing that we're doing the right thing, but in the long term, we will be making things even worse mm. for those people. Mm. And uh, um, this, this graph that's up on the screen in front of me now of the proportion of general practitioners across the country who prescribed an antibiotic for more than 50% of consultations for an upper respiratory tract infection is to me a terrible, terrible tragedy. Mm. And, and that's mostly what in most countries is antibiotics are prescribed for. That's the common reason, infectious reason, for people to see a GP. There's some discussion here about the um, current guidelines with regards to sore throat and the prescription of Lamoxyl versus penicillin there. Do you have a comment on, on you know, the use as, you, as we're trying to push for narrow spectrum antibiotics? Um, our guidelines are uh, possibly leading us in a different way or inappropriately. Um, so yes, that, that's partly why I put up that um, figure from Sweden about um, the guidance. That is for children 0 to 6, and they don't have um, uh, rheumatic fever in Sweden, I'm sure, or um, extremely rarely in immigrant populations. But um, the same message will apply in Sweden in terms of um, guidelines for um, use of penicillin in older age groups as well. We made a, we, not me actually, but um, as a profession, we made a decision in New Zealand that the guidelines would recommend amoxyl rather than penicillin for convenience. Mm. And I believe that decision was wrong. I think it was um, uh, dumbing down medicine. I think it was being uh, uncaring about antibiotic resistance. I think it was... Um, making uh, convenience of medicine for the family much more important than the true use of the right medicine. And I think we'd run the risk of um, convincing our patients that we don't really care enough to do absolutely the right thing for them. And I think if we cared absolutely enough to do the right thing for them, we would do what we would do ourselves. And that should be in our own use, penicillin, rather than amoxyl for strep pyogenes infection. And we have, I think, made a wrong decision. And I think we make the same wrong decision saying it's too hard for a child to take flucloxacillin. Yes, I'll accept it's not easy. But compared with other countries, we have given in on that very, very quickly. And we will pay the price of it using a cephalosporin instead of Flucloxacillin for treating staphylococcal infection will not come without a price. So you're saying it's not, it's not, you know, it's an effective treatment, but it's it's got a price on its head. And our, our yes. choice to make things easier for patients can be having a, a worldwide or nationwide effect. We absolutely. When we prescribe a moxel for a person who only needs penicillin because we're treating strep pyogenes infection, we are killing off. 50% of the E. coli in that person's gut mm. in a way that we wouldn't if we were prescribing penicillin. Mm. We're saying we're quite prepared to disturb that person's intestinal flora completely unnecessarily with a broad spectrum antibiotic, amoxyl, mm. when we could be using a narrow spectrum antibiotic that would have much, much less effect on the person's gut. Mm. We are degrading that person's internal microbiome environment unnecessarily. And we're doing it because you can do it once or twice a day and you, for sheer convenience. It's not something to feel proud of. 
there are some um, questions coming through about the use of doxycycline in terms of the prophylaxis for malaria and long-term treatment of acne and whether you know, whether we're doing the right thing there or what we should be potentially doing differently. I think um, acne, um, we, we do use a lot of antibiotics for uh, doxycycline for acne. Um, doxycycline actually is the the volume of doxycycline is larger than any other antibiotic in New Zealand yeah. um, because we use so much. Um, I'm not a general practitioner. I don't look after people with acne. Um, and so I'm not the person to say what is actually best for managing acne, but I'm not sure that it's doxycycline. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, possibly there are other drugs that are better. Um, in terms of uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for malaria, um, well, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. and um, I think we need to be using antibiotic prophylaxis for malaria and for traveller's diarrhoea as well, um, much more wisely than we possibly have. But I think they're small issues compared with some of the others that I've talked about tonight. Do you, um, you have any data on the breakdown of different prescribing in different PHOs or in different settings such as urgent care, accident and emergency care versus general practice care? I don't have information about um, emergency care versus general practice care. Um, you can see from the figure that's maybe on the screen in front of you now that there is a great deal of diversity in general practices about how they prescribe for respiratory tract infections. And I expect there's a great deal of diversity um, between general practices and emergency care. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people feel that emergency care may be less conservative in terms of antibiotic prescribing than general practices are. Mm. It's suggested. I don't have any data to say that's the case. Others may have. I, I don't. Mm. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, you, I think you pretty well answered most okay. of it there. Um, there was a question. Do, do the countries with a lower antibiotic use have different diagnostic tests available so they are able to offer um, people, some people on here have been really, you know, they've been discussing how they swab sore throats, they use um, tactics to be able to convince patients that they don't need antibiotics and are there different things available in these countries that have lower antibiotic prescriptions going out where they can use those techniques to show their patients that, that this is not necessarily something they need? I think um, we're relatively um, well supplied with uh, laboratory services in New Zealand and there will be people listening who've practiced in the UK mm. and seen just how difficult it is to get community laboratory testing um, as a general practitioner in the UK. Mm. Uh, we're, we're well supplied with laboratories around the country. Mm. Um, in terms of desktop testing, for instance, um, point of care testing for um, is this a streptococcal pharyngitis? Um, well, there are tests available, but they tend to be um, not very, um, not as reliable as you would hope. Um, they, they give a, um, about an 80 or 90% chance of that the person um, has a strep pyogenes infection. The best ones do in some studies. Um, the one, when they were tested in New Zealand, they didn't do very well at all. So that I think there are other tests that are available, but they don't seem to make it. I don't think that they are going to make a huge difference to prescribing. I actually think the mental set of the prescriber is what will make a difference. Right. And also the mental set of the patient coming through the door. Some of you will have noticed that in all of the graphs, the um, the rate of risk of dispensing to Asian people was the lowest. Mm. Um, Asian people, I think, probably, and I don't have the information to be certain of that, but I think that Asian people, there it is um, by month of the year, I suspect they go to the doctor less frequently and so get a prescription less frequently. Um, and uh, I think that... Uh, there's cultural issues about going to a doctor and um, cultural issues about maybe seeking other sorts of health care. Uh, and I think that um, changing the mindset of patients about whether they need to go to a doctor at all mm. and um, whether they need to um, uh, try and convince the doctor to give them an antibiotic prescription um, is the other part of this story. Mm. And it's a huge part. There's a question here, is antibiotic prescribing related to the patient paying a fee? Like we were discussing earlier, the transactional yeah. side. Um, and in the UK, there's no fee to see a GP. So is there a difference in the expectation that comes from your patients? And certainly multiple people have said along the way here, um, not so much questions, but said 
you know, actually our patients will go elsewhere. They are they are shopping around until they find someone who gives them a prescription. Um, and so is, are we, you know, are we... Is there a could, I, could I ask how often that really happens? Um, my wife's a GP and I hear from time to time about patients who um, move elsewhere and um, then sometimes come back again or don't or try different um, doctors in the practice. Um, uh, I would have thought that um, most patients see their doctor as a um, expert in their field mm. and might occasionally try elsewhere. Um, but if your patients really are going to abandon you over you not giving a prescription of a moxel or whatever for a person presenting with a cold, then I think that the degree of loyalty is much less mm. than I would expect actually occurs. I think this is a I find it hard to believe that it's really is a major issue, but I'm not working in general practice. I've got to say that I do not. This is not, um, you know, the sharp end of the problem for me. I'm not going home at night thinking, goodness, I haven't earned enough money because everybody's abandoned me for the guy down the road who's prescribing a moxel for everything. But the, we have had a couple of responses to that. There's um, been someone who had, works in urgent care for 30,000 consults a year, and they said someone doctor shopping for antibiotics they think every day um, with a thousand enrolled patients as well. There is a lot of stuff that's come through about um, patient education and is there a push out there um, at a high level to be educating our patients and our communities, not just one-on-one -on -one as a GP, but um, through the Ministry of Health? And is that a, a better idea or a, a complementary idea? Can I come back to that in a minute and just stick with the doctor shopping for a minute? Yeah. So. Each of us are highly trained professionals with hopefully a great deal of pride in our job as a doctor. If we lose a few patients who move down the road because we're doing the right thing, is that worse than continuing to do the wrong thing and hold on to those patients? Really, I think we need to be saying this is what is right and if we lose a few we're not going to starve and end up, you know, on the street. None of us are going to end up living in a caravan as a result of that. Um, I really think it's an, it's an unnecessary obsession about um, a financial situation that actually I do not believe is going to impact significantly on general practitioners if they change their way of prescribing. And I do agree that there's an interesting question about whether paying a fee for service versus not paying a fee makes a difference to patients' um, feelings of entitlement to tell the doctor what to do. But mm. in the end, I think that the doctor is the expert and needs to tell the patient, this is what I think is right, and this is not what I think is right. Mm. In terms of um, um, campaigns to change pres prescriber behaviour in New Zealand and campaigns to change public perception of antibiotic use in New Zealand, I would say that the one that's had most impact in recent years is the one that I saw Every time I went past a bus shelter um, two or three years ago, the two um, Pacific Island children with their shirts off, mm -hmm. one who had a horrific scar down the front of his chest and the other one who looked a little bit more bulky and robust, I'm um, standing beside him. And the, the slogan was, um, I almost lost my brother to rheumatic fever or something similar. And I think that um, was a hugely impactful um, public education program that also I'm sure had a huge impact on prescribers up and down the country and I'm sure had good and bad effects and I think that we could have similar education um, campaigns in New Zealand that would educate people that we need to make changes not for us but for our children and for our grandchildren and that they won't thank us if we don't. They'll look back and say not only did we not care about making the difference, but we carried on despite the fact that we were being told it's a problem and we ended up with infections that have become very, very difficult to treat and more people dying of infections than happen now in our time. Mm. And I think that's a responsibility we have, just as we have to make sure there's some fish in the ocean and that all the lakes and rivers aren't unswimmable. There has been a couple of responses here that where people have talked about what they actually do, and one of them was, um, you know, they find that patients come in acutely unwell. They they don't seem to care about um, antibiotic resistance. They just want to get better. Um, yes. But if you link that resistance directly to them and um, discuss that, you know, you, you need to save the antibiotics for when you really need them, so that you are 
able to be able to take them and they will work for you that they do get a bit of response from that and people tend to to prick up their ears when they're sick um, the other thing that people have talked about other options like uh, green prescriptions and um, someone's talked about the the advertisements from um, Buckley and Burner, which is the the viral um, treat management and treatments, and I guess that perception between viruses and bacteria. And should we be looking at all these other alternatives um, and maybe pushing them further for our patients so they they're getting effectively what they think is a is a transactional consult, but in an effective way that we're preventing the antibiotic resistance. I do think that, yes, we need a whole lot of different um, mm. skills to use when we're um, persuading a patient, hopefully successfully, that the, an, that an illness that we think is due to a virus or is due to a bacterium but will get better on its own, that, we don't, that we're not going to prescribe an antibiotic for it. Mm. And sometimes that's um, using other um, things to help with the symptoms uh, or um, saying, well, yes, sometimes a back pocket prescription is right. Um, I think that those are steps that we take to educate patients that they don't need an antibiotic prescription every time. Mm -hmm. And over a period of a number of years, we'll have a better educated population mm -hmm. who'll come to us less frequently for those sorts of infections. Can I just yes. jump ahead? Because we have got a slide that I'd like to draw your attention to, um, because it's not something that, um, but I, that I would suggest that those who are interested might like to um, take down the details or, or come back to the slide after the um, presentation and go onto YouTube and look at the video. So this, um, the picture shows a, a huge rectangular agar plate. You can see it's not quite as big as a um, table tennis table, but I think of it as about that size. So it's two feet by four feet. It's covered in agar. And at one end of the, uh, at, at the far right and the far left hand ends of the agar plate, E. coli was put on. And the agar in, the, um, in strips heading towards the middle of the agar plate, you can see the black um, tape um, markers. Uh, in the, at this end, no antibiotic. At this end, no antibiotic. In here, 10 times the um, uh, concentration of ciprofloxacin and in here, 10 times the concentration of ciprofloxacin that most E. coli can survive in. In here, 100 times, and in here, 1,000 times. And the video taken from above shows the E. coli over the space of 10 days spreading from the no antibiotic to the 1,000 uh, time concentration of antibiotic in the center. It's a, it's a graphic demonstration of the evolution of antibiotic resistance in E. coli to ciprofloxacin. Anybody who sees it is astonished by it. It's, it just um, provides a visual demonstration of the process that um, I'm suggesting we should change antibiotic prescribing for to try and prevent it happening with all sorts of bacteria in New Zealand. It is a truly horrifying video to watch. I think um, you know all of us as as practitioners should watch it, and and we certainly in our unit watched it, and we're we're incredibly horrified. And I think you know patients, if you really need to be convincing them, is this something we could use because it it really does show in a short length of time, it's ten days that resistance developing. The video only takes two minutes, so <laughs> yeah, and it's got a great um, narration in the background. It's it's worth seeing. Now, let me just check through what we've got left in questions here. Um, do you have any NNT data for various infections? Number needed to treat? Yes. Um, uh, well, it depends on what you measure as the outcome. So that, for instance, cystitis, um, uh, there are studies where people have treated cystitis with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory mm. versus an antibiotic and shown rather similar outcome. It depends on which day you measure the outcome. Mm. If you measure the outcome early on, antibiotics are better. If you measure the outcome later, um, the non steroidal is a bit better. Um, so that it depends on what you measure. If you're dealing with pyelonephritis, well, I wouldn't recommend um, non steroidal uh, over antibiotics. If it's um, pneumonia, um, definitely it's an antibiotic. And if it's a person who's susceptible to rheumatic fever um, for whatever reason that we don't at the moment understand, but I suspect is probably due to inherited um, uh, propensity that's more common in Marian Pacific people, I believe, um, then it's penicillin and not um, anything else. And the number needed to treat almost doesn't matter. 
Fantastic. And there has been a couple of questions around pre, peri and post-op antibiotic use. So the hospital's uh, not perfect at this. Um, and um, essentially, um, I, I presume you're asking about prophylactic antibiotics to reduce the chance of post-operative infection. Mm. Essentially, the antibiotic should be given, ideally, an hour before knife hits skin, and for short operations, one dose in the hour before the knife enters the skin is all that's required. For very long operations, and for operations where there's a lot of blood loss and a lot of um, transfusion, then a second dose might be given at about four hours. Days beforehand don't help. Days afterwards don't help. A dose in the hour before knife hits skin and occasionally a second dose during the course of the surgery. And I know that that's not what's done in a lot of surgical practice, but we are working in the hospitals to try and change that and have been working successfully in a number of hosp in hospitals across New Zealand to change that in a lot of areas of surgery. There is a question around topical antibiotics and whether we should be using them, um, whether they are something we should be have more specific guidelines around, uh, and whether they are um, contributing to the antibiotic resistance we see. They are the antibiotic method of administration that is most likely to contribute to antibiotic resistance because you have at some points on the skin where the antibiotic has been smeared on a high concentration of antibiotic that will do a good job of killing off the organisms and then at other parts of the skin you have a very low concentration of antibiotic that will do a very poor job of killing <laughs> off the organisms and only those that are a little bit um uh, that that have a little bit of resistance will will be able to proliferate and you will select at the edges of where you've put on the topical antibiotic um, resistant organisms, or you potentially will. So the topical antibiotics are the best possible way of selecting for antibiotic resistance. And yes, we have data that shows that high rates of use of fusidin, Foban, in New Zealand, has selected for increasing levels of Foban, fusidic acid resistance, in Staphylococcus aureus in New Zealand. And even worse, that the selection of fusidic acid resistant strains has tended to favour the selection of MRSA strains. So by using lots of Foban in New Zealand, we have increased the proportion of staphylococci in New Zealand that are MRSA. Um, so um, yes, use topical antibiotics for those infections where the organisms can be reached by the antibiotic in the ointment. Don't use topical antibiotics for boils or cellulitis, just like you wouldn't use topical antibiotics for pneumonia or pyelonephritis or cystitis. If the depth of the skin and subcutaneous tissues means down to the site of infection, as it is with boils and cellulitis, is sufficient that the antibiotic's not going to reach, then don't put it on. If it's impetigo in a small area, then yes, a topical antibiotic um, smeared on to the areas where the infection can be reached by the antibiotic, then yes, you might use a topical antibiotic. We do use fusidic acid, Foban, and mupiracin, Bactroban, very, very, very heavily in New Zealand compared with other countries. And we've ended up with a lot of Staph aureus resistance to mupiracin, Bactroban, and a lot of Staph aureus resistance to Foban fusidic acid, and as I say, that has increased the proportion of staph aureus that are MRSA. So they are on, you know, we should be reducing our, our general antibiotic prescriptions as oral, as well as our topical, as much as possible, um, finding alternatives or using narrow range antibiotics if possible, if we needed to. Uh, there's a comment here on the use of topical antiseptics and, as an alternative for topical antibiotics, and is that a reasonable call? Yeah, chlorhexidine as um, liquid soap is a good um, uh, topical antiseptic to use. Um, uh, there's very few studies that show that it actually is helpful, but I've got to say that in patients that I see with repeated boils, um, I think that that's a helpful um, antiseptic to use um, to try and 
decrease skin colonization. It's certainly the topical antiseptic that's favored in hospitals in New Zealand as a preoperative skin preparation to try and reduce the amount of antibiotic, no, amount of organisms mm -hmm. on the skin before surgery. And on that, there's, there's Christoderm, hydrogen peroxide and betadine are all of them alike in Chris, terms of use? Christoderm is hydrogen peroxide and yeah, um, yeah and, um, that seems to be um, a topical agent that seems to be close to effic same efficacy as mm. Foban or Bactroban. Um, there are studies going on, I think, at the moment um, in New Zealand looking at that. Uh, but other studies overseas have suggested that it's very close in efficacy and it's an agent that um, is not going to develop resistance to um, any of the agents that we've been talking about today. It looks as though it probably would be a safe thing to use in everybody all the time and we wouldn't get antibiotic resistance right. from it. So a useful alternative. Yes. Um, there has been a lot of discussion that's come in about length of scripts. So five days, seven day. Um, is there a difference in, in the potential resistance of a five day script versus a seven day script? There certainly is. Um, okay. Just as there is in a five day script versus a 50 day script. Nobody's going to give a 50 day script. But in essence, there, the um, <laughs> The effect on antibiotic resistance is usually not on the bacterium that we're treating when we are actually treating a bacterial infection. It's on the other organisms that are in the gut or on the skin. Mm. So that we think this person's got a strep pyogenes infection, I'm giving them amoxyl or penicillin or erythromycin or whatever. And we imagine in our minds the penicillin or amoxyl all going and focusing in the tonsils and the throat and killing off the strep pyogenes. And we forget that it's everywhere else in the body. And the effect is not so much on the strep pyogenes, although it will be on that as well, and the other streptococci in the mouth, but it's also on the organisms in the gut. And so the more antibiotics, the more resistance, whether they're perfectly justified antibiotics or completely unjustifiable antibiotics. Mm. And the longer you go on for, the more resistance you're going to get. So that the goal should be to use sufficient dosing to kill the organisms off as quickly as possible. And when the person's recovering, as early as possible, stop the antibiotics. And so there's many um, articles now about um, don't keep taking the antibiotics till you finish the course. Stop the antibiotics for many of the rather self-limiting infections that people get treated for in general practice, stop them when you're clearly improving. Don't keep going and finish the course. Mm -hmm. That further antibiotic when you're already better is not making you any better. It's just helping to contribute to antibiotic resistance and to side effects from the antibiotics. I guess the only um, concern might be there with the strep throat. So there's that oh, certain absolutely. length of time. Yes, yeah. so okay, that's yep. a, absolutely. That's a, Strep throat, 10 days. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Don't do it with treatment of tuberculosis. Yes. Don't do it with treatment of HIV infection. There's a few other infections. But yes, you need three yeah. days to treat cystitis or five days with some antibiotics. You need seven days for pyelonephritis generally. So yes, there are some guidelines, but in general, we have guidelines that have um, that recommend for many things, antibiotic courses that are longer than we need. Mm. Um, someone's mentioned that there are scripts that come out um, for COPD patients from a hospital that are long, 50-day or more <laughs> antibiotic prescriptions. As GPs, we uh, do we continue to facilitate that in the community? I think that needs to be a discussion with um, the community and with the doctors in the hospitals as well. So that, yes... Um, um, azithromycin, um, there's a lot of respiratory physicians would like to give azithromycin or other macrolide antibiotics, erythromycin, roxithromycin, etc., for their immunomodulatory mm -hmm. effects mm -hmm. um, and um, turn a blind eye to the effects on antibiotic resistance selection. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. Are the benefits enough to justify the harms? And often they'll say, oh, well, we've seen the studies and you get the benefit from these drugs in the patients and you can see the benefit after a month or two. And when the study finishes at 12 months or 18 months, you can't see any evidence of resistance in the 300 patients who've been in the study. Um, yes, that's right. But it's not right. It, that's not the full story. And everybody knows that if you put a whole lot of people on azithromycin for a long period of time, you'll select for more 
macrolide resistance, despite what those studies show. Um, back to the, the length of time, and, and obviously that's the, the longer scripts and that's a bigger, a wider issue. Um, would a higher dose for a shorter length of time in terms of treating antibiotics, is that a, a, a potential option or is that still something that you might be worried about? I think you certainly want to be using um, the, the mm. um, optimal dose mm. uh, rather than half dosing or quarter dosing. Um, so that, yes, I think you want enough of the antibiotic at the site of infection that you get maximal antibiotic effect on the organisms that are causing the infection. Mm. And you want to do that for as long as necessary to um, facilitate recovery mm. so that, um, Yes, uh, there's been, for instance, um, concern about potentially underdosing uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae when it's causing otitis media, and there have been recommendations about making sure that children being treated for otitis media get an adequate dose of penicillin or amoxyl to have enough um, antibiotic in the middle ear to deal with those streptococci that are relatively resistant to penicillin. Mm. Um, so you do want enough there at the site of infection to do the job and then you want to discontinue when the person's getting better. Um, that's a very good summary, I think, because a lot of those questions, the length of time and the amount that we give is very important. And, I, you know, yes, there are going to be times we are going to need to give prescriptions. prescriptions. So doing it the best way that we can to reduce the resistance as well um, is, a, is a big deal. Absolutely. There is a question here about probiotics, and um, someone has read that the bacteria sold in probiotics show levels of antibiotic resistance. And is there some evidence that this resistance is transmitted to our enteric bacteria? Do you have any knowledge or, or thoughts about this? I don't know about that. I know that there's occasional reports of infection due to organisms in probiotics that in the occasional person then have got from the gut and into some site where they've then caused infection, but they're pretty rare. And you can imagine if you diagnose that, that's a great thing to put a case report in some medical journal about. Mm. Um, my own belief is that uh, most probiotics are excessively um, uh, simple, that there's usually one or two or sometimes four different microbes in the probiotic preparation, that they're often lactobacilli or um, some other um, simple, relatively harmless or most commonly harmless organism, um, and that in general, they in no way reflect the huge diversity of organisms that live on us and in us. So for me, the idea that swallowing a little bit of lactobacillus or something else, the amount that you could get in a tablet, um, and that that would make a difference to the diversity of organisms that's in your intestines or in your vagina, um, to me is um, fantasy. Uh, when when you've seen, you know, the articles about the fact that there's, you know, hundreds of different species of bacteria inside your gut or even inside your mouth um, and how they uh, are all interacting with each other, the idea that you put less than a teaspoonful of some other organism um, in, a, in you and make a difference seems to me um, wishful thinking. But I will acknowledge that there are studies that suggest they make a difference for um, diarrhea or um, other problems. And yeah, I, I think that we, we will understand the microbiome better in the future. It'll take a while and we'll end up with very sophisticated um, microbiome um, uh, treatments where we will give a particular organism that's necessary, say, for fixing Clostridium difficile or mm -hmm. other problems. Mm -hmm. And hopefully one day for fixing, I don't know, ulcerative colitis or maybe even eczema or who knows what. Along those lines, there has been a specific question about the buccaline um, treatment that you can buy for vir antiviral treatment. I think it's um, it's a range of bacteria, isn't it? I think it's killed bacteria, strip various streptococci, um, maybe some other organisms as well, maybe a homophilus or something like that. I think they're dead and they're produced by a Swiss company, aren't they? Yeah. And you're putting dead streptococci and dead maybe one or two other organisms in your mouth in the hope that that'll stimulate your immune system. And I have a similar sort of attitude to that, that the evidence that that makes any difference, I think, is essentially lacking. And the idea that it would make any difference to me is... Um, uh, implausible, that the number of organisms that are in our mouths 
um, stimulating our immune system and are continually changing depending on what we breathe in or what we swallow um, is so dynamic that um, a little bit of buccaline burner, um, it's sort of like whistling to keep the elephants away. <laughs> Great. So there's a couple more, and I think then we're, we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to just try and get through those last couple of questions. One is, um, on: do, have you seen much chloramphenicol resistance? Uh, I wouldn't even see chloramphenicol resistance. I wouldn't know about it because um, the laboratories don't test for chloramphenicol uh, because apart from drops in the eye, um, nobody ever prescribes chloramphenicol. Okay. Um, so um, it could be there. I don't know what level. I've never prescribed it orally or intravenously. Um, I've prescribed it and used it um, for conjunctivitis. Um, so I'm sure I could ask um, uh, local laboratories what proportion of, say, staphylococci or streptococci are susceptible to chloramphenicol in New Zealand, um, but I just don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, there has been a question about what are your thoughts on the use of a stat dose of azithromycin versus seven days of doxycycline for the treatment of chlamydia? Uh, they seem to be equivalent. Okay. They do seem to be equivalent. Um, uh, I'm not really the person to ask, but uh, that's a sexual health um, specialist question, but they do. I guess there was that consideration of the length of, of time of taking an antibiotic, you know, a one day or a stat dose versus a seven day. Yes, course. Um, azithromycin has a rather long half-life and um, so it persists in the tissues for um, two or three days after you've taken your stat dose. It's mm -hmm. not as all, though it's all gone in a couple of hours. So it does persist in sufficient concentrations to do some good against the um, chlamydia that's present. Mm -hmm. And so an antibiotic that persists long enough to do some good against the chlamydia that's present for two or three days is likely also to be persisting at low levels for some days after yes. that. Um, th there's an interesting discussion about whether you'd better to have an antibiotic that's all gone in a matter of hours and you just keep dosing it, or mm. whether it's, and whether the risk is greatest, analogous to what I was saying about um, topical preparations, if you have a gradually falling off concentration of the antibiotic that at six or seven days is just the right amount yes. to select the resistant strains that can survive in that amount but would be killed by a higher amount and are the stepping stone to an even more and more resistant strains. So there's not, not, a, not a perfect answer there yet? I don't think there's a perfect answer there yet. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, if it was me having my chlamydia treated, I'd probably take the azithromycin. It's yeah. convenient. Yeah. But I wouldn't be upset about, I'd probably be sufficiently worried about my chlamydia. <laughs> I hope my wife's not listening now. Um, to, um, to take the um, doxycycline for the full 10 days, yes. Um, and the very last question here, is, which is quite a good one to end on, I think. Is there a chance of reversing the resistance that we're seeing if we change our prescribing? Yes, there is a chance. But what tends to be found um, is that resistance emerges much more quickly than it goes away, that it tends to persist and fall much more slowly. So that, for instance, um, we, those of us who've been practicing for a while have seen the dramatic rise in resistance of Neisseria gonorrhea to ciprofloxacin, where it started off at zero and within 10 years it was up at 60%. And then people stopped using ciprofloxacin for gonorrhea. And all around the world, there's a very, very slow fall in resistance to ciprofloxacin and gonorrhea. The people in Iceland were very concerned about streptococcus pneumoniae and resistance to erythromycin. And they put in place a, a program to reduce erythromycin use in Iceland. And the rate of resistance in strep pneumoniae to erythromycin did fall but it fell pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. So that um, you're better not to get there than to try and get out of trouble when you've already got there. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Thomas. It's been a really challenging and hopefully quite a practice changing um, webinar for our listeners. I think um, there is a lot of information in there and the webinar video and slides will all be placed on our website for people to be able to see down the track. Um, in the next week and we'll also put a link for the YouTube clip here and also um, some of the resources that we have underneath for, for this so thank you it's very 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 interesting um, also on our website you'll see our next webinar which is coming up on the 12th of June it's on tinnitus doesn't need to rule your life it's by Dr Grant Searchfield
um, and it's about practical management and um, tools that we can use in primary care to help treat tinnitus. So thank you everyone for listening tonight. Thank you for listening and thank you for your questions. I hope I haven't been too uh, unpleasant. <laughs>